I would like to thank Underwoods Vauxhall in Colchester for lending me this, the brand new Vauxhall Astra. This is the eighth generation model. There's been a Vauxhall Astra on sale in the UK since 1980, and it has a special place in my heart because my first car was a 1992 Mark III Vauxhall Astra, and I've actually owned three of them. It's been very popular in this country. Question is, can this be just as popular? Firstly, what about the design? I'm not gonna bore you with what the designer is trying to convey in this voxel visor. Just look at it. I would say though, it looks better in person than it does on the camera. So this is the front, this is the side. There are different wheels available and different colors. I do like this here. This is a nod back to the older Astras. And this is the rear. Shark fin aerial, small vertical brake light. Looks very race car. And the boot release is integrated into the badge. There are four engines to choose from. Two petrols, both of them are 1.2 litres with three cylinders, either with 110 PS of power or 130 PS of power. You can also get it with a 1.5 litre diesel, which has 130 PS of power, but you can also get a plug-in hybrid. That comes with a 1.6 litre turbo petrol and a 12.4 kilowatt hour battery that can propel this thing on electricity alone for up to 43 miles. This one is the 1.2 litre with 130 PS of power, 230 newton meters of torque and an eight speed automatic gearbox. Apparently it can get from zero to 60 miles per hour in 9.7 seconds and it should be able to do 50 miles to the gallon. The boot is a little bit below average for this size of car at 352 liters. It does have a false floor though, so that you can get rid of the low lip and you can fold down the seats. Take the parcel shelf out. When you fold down the seats, it's 1,268 liters. And when you fold them down, you get a nice flat load area. You can also get the Astra as an estate. And when the seats are up, you have 516 liters of space in the boot. And if the seats are down, you have 1,553 liters. When you get in the Astra, it does feel nice. This is the top spec model with these Alcantara seats or the inserts at Alcantara. The top spec is called the Ultimate and I've got Alcantara in the door inserts as well. And when I close the door, that's a good sound. Let's see how easy it is to get comfortable. The seats are comfortable. Let's look at the steering wheel. Mm, in and out, not as much as I'm used to and up and down, not as much either. Anyway, I can get comfortable for me. I'm 178 centimeters high, five foot 10, and I am longer in the torso than I am in the leg. So turn the ignition on, because these electric seats don't seem to work very well with the ignition off. They do work, but they keep stopping. Let's see how close I can get to the pedals. Will I be able to reach them if I had really short legs? And the answer is yes. Yes, yeah, very easy to reach those. And how far back does it go? This is the problem with electric seats. You see, if you're trying to review a car, you kind of have to wait for them to go back. Hmm. Oh, it's dragging my feet back now. And, ooh, that's far. I can barely reach the pedals with my tiptoes. And I have memory seats here, so I can press number one, and it should take me back to where I was. I do like these seats. There's also plenty of adjustment in how high the seats can go. And you can even tilt the seat forwards like this or like that with this little knob. And it does go quite high. My hair is now touching the ceiling. The rear doors open this much, which makes it actually quite easy to get in. And once I'm in, my feet go under the seat in front. And this seat is set in the same position as the driver's seat, which is set in my driving position. We have some adjustable vents here, somewhere to charge your phone and somewhere to store things. And there's a little rubber mat at the bottom of that. I think you can get this with heated rear seats and the controls are down there. The seats back here, Alcantara again, nice. And there are headrests and they do get in the way. So if I put it up, it doesn't dig into my back. If I pull this down, armrest, my elbow doesn't fall into it. That's actually really comfortable. And I do have a ski hatch for long items. Moving over to the door, 
nice bit of padding there. Got two nice armrests and the door sounds like, that's a good sound again. I'll open it so there's light in here and you can see Alcantara here. This is padded and nice. That's nice and smooth, although this does feel cheap. And there are pockets in the backs of the seats. Black roof lining here with two individual lights that you can turn off and on individually. Here's a quick idea for what you get in each trim level. I'm not gonna include everything because that would take too long. I'm just gonna pick out the key features. There's three levels, design, GS line, and this one, the top spec ultimate. Even the base level is fairly well equipped. You get high beam assist, cruise control with intelligent speed adaptation, and you get the two 10 inch displays on all the models, including the base model, wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, and you get electronic climate control. Go up to the GS line and that adds adaptive cruise control, a 360 degree parking camera, a dual zone climate control, heated steering wheel, although I can't get the heated steering wheel to work, heated front seats, a automatic dimming rear view mirror and keyless start and entry. And go for this model, the top spec ultimate model with the Alcantara seats and you get the pixel headlights. Now I hear they're some of the best headlights on the market. They're very good at adapting for different situations and giving you the best view possible. Gets eight speakers instead of the six speakers that the two lower models get. It has a heads up display, a wireless charger, and it's got a heated windscreen and a very big panoramic sunroof. Now for a detailed view of the interior. The front doors are similar to the rear. In this model, it's Alcantara, but in different models, you get different materials. That's nice feeling. This is nice feeling. That's nice and soft. This is very cheap feeling. And there's no felt lining in the door bin. You can fit a very big bottle here. I've only got a half a litre bottle, but I'm sure a two litre bottle will fit there, no problem. This feels nice. Mm, yeah, it's nice and soft. Good armrest that, good for my arm on the steering wheel. And here's your window controls, the mirror controls with some piano black plastic there. Let's come round to, uh, to beside the steering wheel. Coin holder, this feels quite cheap. That feels nice, nice and soft, nice and soft. Soft on the top too. This air vent can be controlled either with this or that, up and down. And you can turn it off by pushing it to the right and you get this flush surface, which is original. I don't think I've seen that before. Heads up display, let's come down to the steering wheel, a good size, a good thickness, more piano black plastic with the buttons for the cruise control, speed limiter, pause and resume your cruise control. This is the adaptive cruise control button and also the lane keep assist. Plus and minus for the cruise, but you press this button in to control the distance and it says okay here and that's quite good because what it does I don't know if you can see the heads up display. If I get close enough, you might see it. It's tiny on that screen, you can't really see it on camera. But if you go past the speed limit sign, it will recognize the speed limit sign and it will say, do you want to change the cruise control? And you press OK and it will change it. That's handy, I've not seen that before. And we've got here some controls for the stereo, volume, phone, voice activation and changing the track. And this button on the end here, just there, changes the trip computer and this button on the end changes what screen you have because you have options of what sort of screens you have on there. These flappy paddles don't exactly feel expensive but they do click nice. A nice satisfying click. Automatic lights and yes of course automatic wipers as well as you expect in 2022. 10 inch screen 10 inch screen, these buttons do feel cheap. You have to press directly on top of it to get it to work. If you press to the side, it doesn't work even though the thing goes down, which was confusing me. And actually heated front window, there's your heated seats, or you can get to them by pressing this button here and then you get like the, the climate thing up here. Can't get the heated steering wheel to work. Just doesn't come on, not sure why. I don't know if it's broken or something. These piano buttons are nice. So with the, with the temperature, you can go up to go up and down to go down. If I push it up, you'll see here, it goes up and down. They're nice because they feel nice. Good quality. Recirc, auto, G 
just your normal climate control buttons, but in a different, different way. I like this. One air vent here, and you think, oh, only one. Normally there's two in the middle, but the passenger gets two on their side, so they're not hard done by. This button feels cheap, very wobbly, and this tray is very thin plastic, but it does actually feel quite strong, and it's felt lined. A drawer here, which is where the wireless charger is hiding. Two USB ports, 12 volt socket, and some storage down here, which is rubber. So that's going to stop things moving around. Lots of piano black plastic, and it's already scratched. I don't know if I can get that on camera, but there's scratches all over it, and this car's got like 200 miles on it. Does it come up there? You see all those lines? And that's just from wiping it. This is where the cup holders are under this tray. Very neat, all these little drawers it has. Easily takes half a litre bottle. We'll take a bigger one. We'll move around, but it's not going anywhere. Let's move that out of the way and close that drawer. I like the drive selector. A very pleasing feel. This material is nice to touch and the feel when you move it between the drive modes is good. You can put it in manual like that or you can press P for park. Uh, when I went to reverse it brought up the 360 degree camera. It's excellent that camera and you've got the front and rear camera here depending if you're going forwards or backwards. Drive mode selector. I can press this to switch between the drive modes. Sport, normal, eco, eco. It's going to go down, yep. And then back to normal. And then the parking brake down for off and up for on as it should be. And then this is rubber, a little bit of rubber storage there. Click this button and voila, we have a large box. Although they've missed a trick because this could be refrigerated. There's no air vent there, but these two channels seem to take the cold air for these vents back there. If they made a little hole in here, that could be cool. As in, you know, not cool as in I've got cool glasses on, I look cool, as in cold. My other half has a Citroen C4 with a box like this, which is cool, and it is nice on long journeys. And the armrest, well, that's padded and nice and good position for my arm, but you can't really adjust it, but it is quite long, so there's plenty of place where you can put your arm. It's just that you can't adjust the height. Up here, we have a frameless automatic dimming mirror, which looks very classy. And if we go higher, we've got some buttons for the lights the SOS button and a two-stage button for the panoramic sunglass. Sunglass? What am I talking about? Panoramic roof. Press it gently, it goes back, let go and it stops, but you press it in all the way, you let go and it goes all the way back. And of course I can close it by pressing it in all the way. I don't know if you can see me press that there, it's probably gone dark because of the exposure, high dynamic range as it's called. Makes it hard for the camera to see. And then sun visors, do they have? lights they do and on this side do we get lights on both sides do we yes good it's good to see this roof lining's nice feels good high quality glove box is it damped sort of <laughs> well it was damped to begin with and then it went quick it should start quick and go slow so it's slow and then quick felt lined and it's a little bit smaller than average it's not too bad Nothing to write home about. Here's the volume knob. Good to see a volume knob and the power button. And this is where you start and stop the engine. I think that's about it. Covered it all there. Yeah. It's a nice place to sit. I do get in this car and feel, feel at home. Now it's time to start driving. I'm gonna start with maneuvering. So I'm very close to this wall in front. Into reverse. Got the cameras. The wing mirrors dip, that's useful, like that. Fairly good visibility around. Off the brake, see how easy it is to stay slow. Have to press the gas to turn the parking brake off. Yep, there you go, it's off now. Then it went fairly quickly there, so I'll probably have to take the parking brake off manually if I wanted to creep back slowly. Yeah, that's, that's better, but it is, I'm still finding it quite hard to keep it super slow. It's either not moving or moving back at sort of that speed, which usually isn't a problem, but in certain situations when it's really tight, that can be quite hard. I do find it fairly difficult to keep this car 
super slow. Sort of speeding up, slowing down, speeding up, slowing down. Oh, I'm doing it now, but that's not super slow. Even slow, this sort of speed I want to keep. Yeah, I can do it. It does take some practice. I believe it is a torque converter. I don't think it is a dual clutch, although it does feel a little bit like it's got a clutch there, the way it sort of suddenly engages and goes back. Let's see how these cameras are when I get close to this wall behind me. So it's got the, the uh, camera showing me what's behind. The 360 degree view. As I get closer, it then goes to a top down view. That's useful. That makes parking easy. Let's go to drive. Let's go forwards and see what the turning circle is like. In fact, I know what the turning circle is like. I've already looked it up. It's 10.5 meters, which is good. That's pretty good. Usually a car this size is around about 11, 11 and a half meters. And I have noticed, yes, this is easy to maneuver. So this top spectrum with the 360 camera, and you get that in the middle spec as well. Light steering too. So this top spec and the middle spectrum, very easy to park with all this visibility I've got, the mirrors dipping, good literal visibility from looking out the windows as well. Better than I'm used to. It's an easy car to park. Now for some out of town roads. I'm gonna put it into manual mode and use the paddles. I'm also going to reset the trip computer once I'm around this bend because I've been stopping and starting all morning long. In fact, it's already the afternoon, half past three in the afternoon, and it's got 9.4 miles to the gallon. Not surprised considering how I've been using it. Okay, that's reset. Let's go. So, hmm, very smooth gears. Barely feel the gears at all. Engine sounds pleasing. It's got that three cylinder from. Yeah, those gear changes are very quick. I'm impressed with that. Not really going fast enough to test the corners yet. I'll have to get to a faster bit of road for that. But it is comfortable, it's smooth. This road is relatively smooth, but there are little bumps in it and it's, well, it's making those almost disappear. Coming up to a 60 soon. This is currently 40 miles per hour, this road. Drop it down in the third, drop it down in the second. There we go. Yeah. Yeah, not bad. 1.2 litre engine, I should say, actually. Very good, considering what it is. Be interesting to see what fuel economy it gets, though. It does seem to change up for me. I don't think the revs were anywhere near the red line when it changed for me then. I wasn't really looking. I thought I had plenty left and it changed up a gear. So down a gear. It's not, it doesn't feel like it's going to be a fun car, but it's not bad either. It's sort of, it's adequate on these roads, but it's more um, directed towards comfort. Let's see if it goes up by itself. Yeah, it does. Oh, it's because the red line is um, way higher on the dash than the actual red line is, I think. It makes these roads easy. That's, that's how I can describe this. This is an easy, comfortable experience. It's not making me feel excited at all. In fact, I've had enough of that. I'm just gonna put it into manual, not manual, drive. Yeah, press the M again, then, then that comes off and just do drive mode and not bother with the gears because I'm not really getting any pleasure out of it. It's very good, I have to say, but this sort of car doesn't really make me want to do it. I just want to relax. Nice, comfortable seats, smooth ride. Be more interested in trying to get some good economy figures than driving this quickly. Now it's time for a launch. So at a standstill, no one coming, floor it. Oh, well that wasn't very good. I'm gonna start that again because the engine turned off. Um, might have to try and stop this engine turning off. Okay, engine on, the engine's on now. So I've got the engine running, standstill, floor it. Okay, that was a bit of a lazy start. Here we go, 30 miles an hour, 50. And there's just about 60 there, I've got 58. Coming up to the bend now. Felt slower than the time suggests. Supposed to be 9.7 seconds. I think it was a, bit, a little bit slow to react to my initial press of the gas. I pressed it and sort of not much happened for a moment and then it got going. Yeah, it feels more like a, an 11 second car to 60 than a, just under 10 second car. 
So this car doesn't excite me. It doesn't make me want to use the flappy paddles to get the maximum performance out of the engine. It makes me want to relax and take a gentle stroll. Over those three miles, I got around about 30 miles to the gallon. It's ticking down now as I'm idling, but it was just over 30. Now it's showing 28.5. That's not that good for a car with this performance. Similar cars have often got around about 40 on that road, on that route I did. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna reset the trip computer and take a gentle stroll through the urban roads towards a dual carriageway. Let's see how it does there. I feel this is where the car is good. On these lower speed limit, boring roads, stop, start. What it does is it makes you feel chilled out and relaxed. This eight speed gearbox has seamless gear changes. I don't even know what gear it is in. I guess it's gear three. No, it's gear four. I just don't know. And fuel economy already 42.7. That's an improvement. Sometimes the stop start system cuts in at an inopportune moment. I'm going towards a roundabout and I see an opportunity and I think, oh, let's go. And just as I go to press the gas pedal, the engine turns off and I have to wait like a second for it to start again. I mean, a second isn't long, but when you're asking the car to go, a second can feel like maybe five seconds, especially at a roundabout when you're thinking, oh, let's go. Oh, what's happening? It's not going. And then the engine turns on and you get going again. This is why I like to turn these systems off in these kinds of cars. It's not a mild hybrid, so it hasn't got that immediate start. It is more like one of the older types of stop start systems where you hear the starter motor kick in as it starts the engine. And it takes just a little bit longer for it to react. Driving sedately on this route can normally get me around about 40 miles to the gallon in an economical car. I'm going downhill at the moment, but overall the route is mostly uphill. There's never really a steep climb, but it's more of a consistent, gentle climb throughout most of the journey. Got the adaptive cruise control on now. Let's see if it slows down for this situation. Nope, 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 yes, now it is. And then it brakes quite hard, so quite hard and quite late. Took a while for it to notice that car there. I was just about to brake myself and now it's slowing me down towards this roundabout behind this car. And yep, it brought me to a stop there. Wasn't very confidence inspiring though because it did start to accelerate and then suddenly brake. It's not the best radar guided cruise control system I've used, but it's far from the worst either. And it's all right. The heads up display is fantastic. It's big. It has a high resolution, it's clear, and the information it displays is useful when you can change what you want on there. You can have the sat nav, or you can have the cruise control like I have now, and of course the speed, and the traffic sign recognition is displayed there as well. It's one of the better systems I've seen. I mean, you can't see it on camera. I tried showing you earlier, but it really is big and clear. I mean, it's about, a third of the width of the lane, but it doesn't get in the way. It's positioned very well. The cruise control has locked onto the car in front. I'm asking for a maximum speed of 40. I'm doing 39 as the car in front's going slightly slower. It's showing me in the heads up display that it can see the car and it's showing me roughly how far away it is. We're coming up to a roundabout, starting to slow down. This time it's slowing down nicely. It's slowing down smoothly. That's confidence inspiring. I'm gonna cover the brake and then it brakes just a bit too hard. It doesn't eat into the space between me and the car in front to brake gently. It brakes, I think it's the car in front braking hard and this copies and tries to keep the same gap. I prefer it to eat into that space a bit and try and smooth out the braking. That's the whole point in keeping a gap between you and the car in front is so you don't have to brake hard if they brake hard. And there's the stop start system again. It's just a bit of a delay for me wanting to go. It's a little bit of a moment when you think, oh, I'm not gonna go when I want to, and then it goes. It makes your decisions a little bit more tricky at roundabouts, especially on the difficult roundabouts where you've got to get going quick. I will be turning that system off, but to be fair, that's the same with most cars with this kind of system. It's just a little bit more harder to turn this off because you have to press a couple of buttons. It's not just one button. So the traffic sign recognition has seen a 30 sign and on the heads up display, it's suggesting 30 miles an hour to me. 
So I'm going to press OK. And there we go. Press it again. There you go, it's changed now. And it's doing 30, following the car in front. But obviously the lights have changed, so I have to stop. It doesn't know that. You still have to drive cars these days. It's just the systems give you a little bit of help and take away some of the monotony out of regulating the sp your speed, trying to keep it within the speed limit. And the steering as well on some cars, keeping you in the center of your lane. Some are better than others. I'll test this system soon. Quite good visibility at roundabouts. The A pillar is in a good place. Sometimes the way it's shaped can make it hard for you to see, but not with this one. It's a nice view around here. I'm at some red lights. I think they're about to turn green soon. The cruise control is set to 30. I wonder if it will move me along if I press play. Well, there it is. I press play. It's accelerating me now up to 30 miles an hour. It took a while to start, but it is doing it. I'm impressed with the economy on the urban roads. I've done four miles, mostly uphill, and it's achieved 42.1 miles per gallon. 40 miles per gallon on that route is good. So 42 is even better. I've just reset the trip computer again to see how the car does on these roads. 70 mile per hour dual carriageways or motorways. This isn't a motorway, but it's just like a motorway in terms of how fast you drive. I've got the radar guided cruise control at 70 miles per hour and the steering assistance on. Let's see if it does this bend. It's doing the bend. I'm holding the wheel, but it's doing the bend. For the next one, I will put my hands near the wheel, but let go so you can see it go around. See, it's working and it's keeping me central. It's not bouncing from side to side. It's not continuously adjusting the wheel. It's holding it steady. This is a good system. I tried it in town and it didn't work at all, but then the systems don't work in town because there's so many lines and things are inconsistent and it's moving from left to right. But here I can just sort of put my arms on the um, armrests, hold the wheel and watch the car keep a good speed and keep a good position and act if I need to. It has told me a few times to hold the wheel when I have been, which is a bit annoying. I don't know if it wants me to hold it up here, but then I can't reach the armrests. It's got to be here for me to reach the armrests. I think it might be because I'm holding it too gently and there's probably pressure sensors in there and it's not sensing my hands on them. I do generally hold the wheel very gently when I'm on a road like this. I'm very relaxed. I don't see the point in squeezing it. But I'm doing 70, not 70, sorry. I'm, I'm doing 60, but the cruise is set to 70. Signaled, change lane, and it's sped up to 70 for me. It's doing 60 because of the car in front. It allowed me to change lane once I put the signal on and now it's keeping me in the middle of my lane again. Again, it's braking too hard for cars moving out. That Volkswagen Polo just moved in front of me there and didn't even need to lift off the gas. It just, but it used the brakes. That was unnecessary. I'll come back to lane one now with the signal. It's allowing me to change lane. It's picked up the lanes again and it's keeping me in lane. Fuel economy. 54.2 that's very good very good so far i think this is actually the car's natural habitat it feels comfortable it's relaxing it's a cruiser if you do long distance big miles this is the car for you well there's other cars out there but this is a good car for you maybe even with the diesel you'd get more uh, miles per gallon you'll get better fuel economy so that might even be the better option I haven't tried that out yet so I don't know but I'm already up to 56.4 57.5 miles per gallon I know I'm not doing 70 right now it's because of the car in front but this is how I would be driving doing 70 as and when I can and every so often having to slow down for the car in front and getting over 50 miles per gallon is impressive from any petrol let alone nearly 60 I'll do a little bit more and see what the average is over a longer distance. This is one of the better lane guidance systems I've used. It does keep me in the middle of the lane and it does move the wheel consistently. It doesn't keep moving it left and right, but it does keep asking me to put my hands on the wheel. I've tested it out. I've had my hands here and here. 
yet it still asks me to put my hands on the wheel even though I've got my hands on the wheel because I don't squeeze it. I, I'm just not the way I drive. Even when I don't have these systems, I hold it very gently and barely um, holding it at all. My hands are there, but I let the car do most of the work and guide it. Uh, but here, to stop it bringing up that message, I do actually, well, I feel like I've got to keep just giving the wheel a bit of a squeeze, which is a bit annoying. So the whole point in the system is for me to be more relaxed, but actually I'm having to remember to squeeze the wheel. I'm sure everybody's different. If you hold the wheel a bit tighter, it won't be a problem, but it is a problem for me. For the motorway and the urban road, I've had the car in eco mode. I want to get good economy and I don't really find much of a difference between the modes. I'm sure that the throttle sensitivity is slightly different, but I'm not used to the car enough to see the difference. However, I have noticed this car does accelerate quite quickly. Um, the cruise control accelerates quite quickly, even when in eco mode, which seems a little bit wasteful. I just went from a 50 to a 70, because there was a short stretch of 50 where I had to turn round. And, um, well, yeah, it put his foot down and really hooned it. And I was thinking, well, you're in eco mode. What's the point in that? Whereas usually I find if you're in eco mode, the cruise control acts more eco. And if you're in sport mode, the cruise control acts more sporty and tries to accelerate more quickly. But this doesn't seem to vary its settings based on the drive mode. I do find these things a little bit of a gimmick. It does weight up the steering in sport mode, but other than that, I'm not really telling much of a difference. And that's the same with most cars I drive, to be fair. Maybe I'm just not sensitive enough to feel that little difference. In my car, my Say at Leon, when I'm in sports mode, I just hate it because the throttle pedal, instead of having your full 100% travel for control, you only have the first half. By the time you get to half throttle, you're at 100% throttle, which is kind of pointless. It just takes away some of the control of the car. Uh, but this one, yeah, it does like accelerating quickly and it likes braking quickly as well when it catches up with a car in front, like this. It's braking quite a lot then. I've got a huge distance, huge. Use some of that distance, brake smoothly. Just coming to the end of this 70 mile per hour route, I've managed to stay at 70 for as much of the time as possible. At the beginning, I was doing between 60 and 70, but the last 10 miles really have been mostly at 70. To be honest, I've been hogging the right lane a little bit, so I don't have to keep slowing down to try and do this test. And it's done 54.2 miles per gallon over the last 23 miles. Slowing down now, even though that car's moving over, come on. I'm gonna to have to slow down and move in now because my exit's coming up. But yeah, 54 miles per gallon. I'm incredibly impressed with this uh, little petrol engine, how it is on these roads. That's a good number. Seems to be quite a lot of performance from this little engine on these roads as well. When you put your foot down, it does go. There's a lot of torque from low down. You don't have to rev it. I thought I'd give these modes a go, and as I suspected, when you're in sport mode, it's not quicker. It feels just as quick in all the modes, it's just in sport mode, the gas pedal's more sensitive. So it feels quicker, but it actually isn't. You just get to full throttle when you're about halfway on the pedal, and it generally holds the gears longer, which just uses more fuel. If you're in eco mode and plant your foot hard on the gas pedal, it will hold the gears for a long time and it'll make you go what feels like just as fast. The reason why I use eco mode is because I think sometimes it saves you fuel in other areas, like air conditioning, for example. It might not on this car, but on some cars in eco mode, the air conditioning goes into eco mode. And the air conditioning on this car is excellent it's really good so if it's putting that in eco mode i'm fine because it's good enough as it is i didn't notice any difference keeps me nice and cool but if i'm saving fuel well i'll take it the hands-free call system is actually pretty good i've just made a call on it and i could hear them well they could hear me well the sound system though is mediocre it's not bad but it's not really good either there's not that much bass to it i mean when i first turned it on all I could hear was bass like everything was what's going on here and I looked at the EQ and the bass was up to full probably because it does lack bass and someone's tried to compensate for that but it just made it sound awful so I put it all back to neutral as the artist intended and um, yeah there isn't that much punch low down but there is plenty of volume 
I just thought I'll try out the sat nav. So I've set it to home. And what surprised me is that the heads up display also showed me the next direction and I'm running Android Auto. So I didn't think that would work. I thought I'd give it a go anyway, but it does actually incorporate the um, Android Auto navigation to the head up display, which I'm very impressed with. It doesn't give a permanent map, but it seems to give me the next way I'm going, like at the roundabout I'm going left, it'll have a roundabout sign with a left symbol on it. I would like to thank Underwood's Voxel in Colchester for lending me this eighth generation Voxel Astra so that I could review it. If you think the video helped you learn a thing or two about the car, please give it a thumbs up. Subscribe to get my future videos. And until the next one, cheerio.